to prayer. Praise God. God is good. Presiding Elder Stegall and Mrs. Stegall's transition of his sister, Bernice Jackson and family, Abu Bangura, Adelia Mitchell, Rietta LaFlores, Miss Catherine Tanks, Marion Benson, Walter Tate, Marie Dennis, Dorothy Evans Daniel, Reverend Adriana Hardy, Leroy Heiter, Miss Willie Pearl Thornton, Zerlina Davis, Tanya Boyd's parents, Trina Rogers, James Smith, Bonnie Heron, Louise Johnson, Shelby Hall, Rosemary Brock, Tiffany A. Pulley and family, Darius Johnson, Betty Jean Henderson, Buffy Henderson, Henry and Bobby Frost, Robin Curitan, Kenaya Curitan, Lucinda Strubrick, Carmen Guido, Coretta Walton, Nidra Willis, Nathaniel Burt, Katrina Burt, Robert Barron, Takeith Lewis, Sheila Neal, the Brown family, Tammy Maureen, Coralie Timmons, Larry McKinnon, Janet Pierce, Tori Bailey, Ellen Lynch, Leonard Dixon, Corrine Toller, Angeline and Thelma Thomas, Deborah James, Marcus L. Mitchell, Dorothy Stewart, James Cates III, Wendy Merritt, Gracie Benjamin, Isra and Gwendolyn Beard, Merlene Williams, Alberta Brown, James Brock, Paul Bacon, Gloria Bird, Sharon Russell, John Madden, Tamara Blunt, Edith Blunt, Caitlin Canty, Robert Hall, Mylon Lawrence, Freddie Lucas, the Cotton family, the Gibbs family, the Rayfield family, Ronzetta Evans, Sheila Collins and family, Beatrice Burrell, Joseph and Freddie Phipps, the Hazards family, Dorothy Hunter, Gantry Habersham, Ora Hambrick, Theodore Gordon, Ursula Gordon Jr., Victoria Hall, Leotha Cunningham, Jonathan Jones, Teresa Blackshear, Mary Copeland, Janelle Thompson, John Lawrence, Mayor Jordan, Neil Lewis, Officer Jared Hunt, Robert Jones, Doug Morris, Miss Betty Benson, Miss Nettie Lewis Moore, Miss Betty Griffin, Miss Estelle Warren, Kathy Seeley, George Huff, Candace Sisko, Sharon Somerville, Baron Daly, Lily Mae Adams, Raquin Roseboro, Rasheen Neal, Pastor and Mrs. Watley and family, Bishop Reginald Jackson and family, Presiding Elder Thomas Stegall and family, the Biden and Harris administration, COVID-19 variant and subvariant, various of all kinds, November midterm election, gun violence, our officials and appointed and elected educators and students returning to school. We breach you with the draw of the Lord and again we are grateful for this opportunity to study the Word of God together. Let us pray. Thank you, God, for this day. Thank you for all that you have brought us through and all that you have brought us to since the last time we uh, studied your Word. And again, we pray for enlightenment, encouragement, and empowerment as we seek from the pages of the ages, wisdom and direction as we face what appears in our sight as the complicated and convoluted issues of these times. Speak, Lord. We, your servants, are listening. In Jesus' name, amen. We continue our focus on the gospel of Mark from, from failure to fulfillment. And to, tonight we look at Mark chapter 12. Let us read 
the first 11 verses, uh, 12 verses. And then he began to speak to them in parables. A man planted a vineyard, put a fence around it, dug a pit for the wine press, and built a watchtower. Then he leased it to tenants and went to another country. When the season came, he sent a slave to the tenants to collect from them his share of the products of the vineyard. But they seized him and beat him and sent him away empty-handed. And again, he sent another slave to them. This one they beat over the head and insulted. Then he sent another, that one they killed, and so it was with many others. Some they beat and others they killed. He had still one other, a beloved son. Finally, he sent him to them saying, they will respect my son. But those tenants said to one another, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him and the inheritance will be ours. So they seized him, killed him, threw him out of the vineyard. What then will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and destroy the tenants and give the vineyard to others. Have you not read the scripture? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is amazing in our eyes. When they realized that he had told this parable against him, they wanted to arrest him, but they feared the crowd, the crowd, so they left him and went away. One of the major distinctions that many of us have failed to comprehend is the difference between management and ownership. We are so inclined to talk about what is ours, but we forget that whatever we have is a trust that God has given us to manage. Psalm 24 is correct. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. They who dwell therein, for he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the flood. God has never given over anything to anyone. God gives us blessings not to own, but to manage. And based on our management and whether we are uh, directing the affairs that God has put in our care with prudence, with wisdom according to the word of God, uh, determines how God seeks to reward us. So whether we're talking about our bodies, our relationships, our careers, our positions or titles, or our possessions, we own nothing. My body, my wife, my husband, my family, my career, my uh, house, my, uh, my uh, clothes, we own nothing. If you don't believe you own it, don't own it, uh, die, as you've heard me say before. Free will, which allows us to make decisions, is a gift. And we are accountable to God for how we use that gift. Ownership is the great lie that the devil uses and we have accepted regarding whatever we have been blessed to receive. And now, now, now what, what makes God such a great owner? is not just the fact that God is the creator of everything. God as the owner is generous. God as the owner is trusting. God as the owner is patient. And God as the owner is just. That evil does not last forever. And so even though evil may be having 
a heyday. Uh, it does not last. God as owner, who is just, God's justice lasts. And we are so grateful that God is patient, that he doesn't cut off our privilege when we are new, misuse, and abuse what has been entrusted to our care. And so then as owner, God demands accountability. And so those servants who were in charge of the vineyard acted as if the vineyard was theirs. But as the owner, God had the right to uh, demand accountability. A and when we manage well, uh, we receive rewards for faithfulness and we also receive judgment for misuse. And sometimes because we haven't uh, gotten or think we are getting away with certain things, we, we, we act as if God has turned over everything to us, but God has not turned over anything in the creation to us. And, and, and God's greatest gift is Jesus Christ. And he is the greatest gifts for repentance, for redemption, and for reconciliation. God's greatest sacrifice for restoration and understanding of biblically based stewardship and management occurred when Jesus died on the cross. And, and so we have to recognize that there is judgment and that one day we will all have to answer as the uh, wicked servants in the parables to the owner. Matthew 25, 31 to 46 reminds us of the day when nations will be judged and some will be on the right, some on the left. And he will say to some, come blessed of my father, for I was hungry, you fed me, I was naked, you clothed me, I was sick, you imprisoned me. And, and they're going to ask, when <clears throat> did we see you like this? He's going to say, and as much as you did to the least of these, you did it unto me and to others, whom he will depart into judgment for not doing that. And they're going to ask, when did we see you hungry and not feed you, clothed, naked and not clothed, you sick and in prison, did not minister. He's going to say, and as much as you did it not, that is the right of the owner to establish principles by which uh, what we have been given is to be governed. And so there is no such thing as my tithe, my offering, that, that, that we give God a tenth of what God has already uh, allowed us and graciously permitted us to manage. Second Corinthians 5.10 remind us, for all of us must appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each may receive recompense, recompense for what has been done in the body, whether good or evil. Revelation 20, 11 through 12, uh, reminds us um, that I saw a great white throne and the one who sat on it, the earth and the heaven fled from his presence and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne and books were open. Also another book was open, the book of life. The dead were judged according to their works as recorded in the books, not according to their mindset, not according 
to or the opinion of others, but, but according to the works found in the book of life. Let's look now at uh, verses um, 13 through 17. Then they sent to him some Pharisees and some Herodians to trap him in what he said. They came to him and said to him, Teacher, we know that you are sincere and show deference to no one, for you do not regard people with partiality, but teach the way of God in accordance with truth. Is it lawful to pay taxes to the emperor or not? Should we pay them or should we not? But knowing their hypocrisy, he said to them, why are you putting me to the test? Bring me a denarius, uh, a coin, and let me see it. And they brought one. And he said to them, whose head is this and whose title? They answered, the emperor. Jesus said to them, give to the emperor things that are the emperor's, to God the things that are God. And they were utterly amazed at him. Let us never forget that the state is ordained by God as a means of civic order and authority. Every community needs order and authority. If you're going to live in community, there has to be some regulations for that community. Not everybody doing what he or she thinks is correct whether we're talking about a church, a home, or a business, whenever there is a community, uh, there must be some system of order and authority. And, and, and when you have a nation, the state represents ordained authority by God. But God is the ultimate authority. There is a limit to loyalty to the state. The prophetic tradition of the Bible is based upon holding the state accountable to the word of God. And one of the unfortunate things that has happened in our time is that we've seen the state uh, manipulate uh, the, the church for its own ends. And we've seen certain aspects of the church bow down to the will of the state. That, that has happened here in America with many in the evangelical right who would uh, sell their soul for uh, uh, power with a uh, defunct and demoral 45th president. It happened for years. In South Africa, when the church bowed down to the state to maintain apartheid um, that, that, that allowed a minority to oppress the majority. We've seen it happen earlier in this country when the church manipulated uh, the scriptures uh, so that the state and individual prophets could, uh, could oppress others. And when you go to the Museum of the Bible in Washington, D.C., you will see a certain section called the, the Slave Bible in which Every reference to freedom and liberation was taken out. That, that, that rather than trying to hold the state responsible, many times the church has uh, gone alone with the state. And the prophetic tradition of the scriptures, uh, Jeremiah, Isaiah, Hosea, Ezekiel, uh, uh, Amos, name them, Joel, all of them stand outside of the state 
and say, thus saith the Lord, because there is a limit of loyalty to the state and persecution of the early Christians in the book of Revelation occurred because followers of Christ follow the lordship of Christ over the authority of the state. We Christians have a biblical and human right, hear this, to oppose ungodly leaders and unjust, discriminatory, racist, and sexist laws, as well as oppressive political regime. We have a biblical and human right to oppose wrong wherever it is found. And the black religious tradition was birthed from the refusal of black believers to accept the racist tradition and practices of this country as morally right and the will of God. That's why we are where we are, and that's how we continue to maintain our tradition. We grew out of a fight against oppression, and we cannot ever uh, become so comfortable that, that we fail to realize that, um, that our first loyalty is to God. St. Augustine in the fourth century declared, for I think a law that is not just is not actually a law. And that was one of, as many of you know, one of the cardinal tenets and principles of Dr. Martin Luther King when they uh, opposed the unjust laws of a segregated society. And when people accused them of being lawbreakers, they said an unjust law is no law at all, which is a different mentality than the attitude of the president who has been voted out of office, who felt that he could manipulate the law to suit his own ends, verses 18 through 27. Some Sadducees who say there is no resurrection came to him and asked him a question saying, teacher, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies leaving a wife but no child, uh, the man shall marry the widow and raise up children for his brother. There were seven brothers. The first married and when he died, left no children. And the second married the widow and died, leaving no children. And the third, likewise, none of the seven left children. Last of all, the woman herself died. In the resurrection, whose wife will she be? For the seven had married her. Jesus said to them, is not this the reason you are wrong, that you know neither the scriptures nor the power of God? But when they rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. And as for the dead being raised, have you not read the book of Moses and the story about the bush? How God said to him, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is God not of the dead, but of the living you are quite wrong that um, what Jesus is saying is that the eternal life of glory where death is forever banished is beyond human understanding and comprehension and so we can we cannot in our finite minds understand all of the intimacies and the realities and the new states of being that come to us in the resurrected body 
in glory. And the quality of eternal life, of glory where sin, sickness, sadness, and every other dimension of earthly life is something we cannot understand. Will, will there be work or various assignments in heaven? What will be the nature of our resurrected bodies? So that there are some things in glory that we have to literally wait to get there to understand what will be there. And, and, and so that in the eternal presence of God, all human relationships are transformed. We must trust God that we will still have love, peace, and joy, and companionship even in transformed relationship. Whether or not those relationships will be formally married, we do not know. But we know that the elements of love and peace and joy and companionship will still be there. Uh, but we do not know the exact form. We must also believe that God has brought through the complexities of transform human relationship and everything in heaven completes what we know and experience only partly and briefly on earth. So when we get there, we'll see this, we'll see that. Well, <clears throat> perhaps we will, but, but will they have the same meaning and dimension? Will the glory of God be so great that it transforms how we see each other? What does it mean to live in, in the presence eternally of that much love? that much glory, that much perfection as persons who had a formal relationship of marriage on earth. How will that all work out? We do not know, and no one can speak with authority. We just have to trust the will, the purpose, and the wisdom of God to know that whatever we have experienced here on earth will find completeness, completion, and fulfillment. And the highest dimension of happiness and joy as we dwell forever in the presence of God. Verses 28 to 34. One of the scribes came near and heard them disputing with one another. Seeing that he answered them well, he asked him, which commandment is the first of all? Jesus answered, the first is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, <clears throat> excuse me, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Then the scribe said to him, you are right. Teacher, you have truly said that he is one and beside him there is no other. And to love him with all the heart, with all the understanding, with all the strength, to love one neighbor as oneself, this is much more important than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that, he answered wisely. He said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. And after that, no one dared to ask him any questions. In, 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 in this discussion, we'd like to see what really matters. Um, the, the Bible, expresses uh, what certain verses express core beliefs. John 3.16, for God so loved the world 
that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but they shall have everlasting life. That verse sums up the essence of the Christian faith. In terms of Judaism, that verb, that um, the essence of the Judaic faith is found in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 9. Hero Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. You shall love the Lord, your God, with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. Keep these words that I'm commanding you today in your heart. Recite them to your children. Talk about them when you're at home, when you are away, when you lie down and when you rise. Bind them as a sign on your hand. Fix them as an emblem on your foreheads and write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. And, and, and so this is called the Great Shema. And um, um, that, that in, in traditional Jewish homes, um, you have the mezuzah. These are the, those little items that you find attached to the door post. Uh, and they have this in there. In, the, in, in those days, um, traditional Jews wore these little four boxes on their foreheads. They were called phylacteries. This verse was in there. And, and, and so, and, and then when the Lord summed up the lesson, he chose this verse, and then he picked up and um, summarized Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18. You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against any of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. And, and so we have to understand that loving the Lord with all of our heart, soul, and strength, and loving our neighbors Find the essence of what it means. If I love the Lord, I will strive to live by his word with all my heart. I will not sin and do that which grieves the Lord. And if I love my neighbor as myself, then, then that means that I will have an other directed spirit that seeks for the welfare and the good of someone else. And, and sometimes... What happens is that the rituals that we use to express our faith um, uh, become fundamental rather than the faith itself. And, and they become major emphasis, sources of disagreement and, and schism, baptism. We, we've split over whether it should be done by immersion only or immersion or uh, sprinkling or pouring. Where they each should be done, should be based on uh, a believer or a believer must uh, confess Christ or can a believer commend their child uh, to the church and to the Lord and be baptized. We, we've, we've, we've fallen out on issues of communion, whether it's grape juice, whether it's wine, how often it's done. Uh, uh, we, we've, we've fallen out on issues of uniform and attire that uh, who wears what and who has on what. And, 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 and so while all of these uh, rites and traditions add to the expression of our faith, they are not fundamental. What is fundamental is not how you baptize. 
What is fundamental is the Lordship of Jesus Christ. What is fundamental is not uh, how you take communion, but whether you understand what it means, the suffering and sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. What is fundamental is not how we dress or our attire, but whether we are clothed in righteousness. And, 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 and we, we must always keep that which is fundamental to the faith in mind and in our own memory. And what Jesus said, you, you're not far from the kingdom, but close to the kingdom it is not necessarily in the kingdom. And, 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 and so that it is our desire not to be close, but to be in the kingdom, in the reign of God. And we cannot do that on our own. It is the blood of Jesus that fills the gap between who we are and to whom we belong and uh, what we are and who God has called us to be. Verses 35 through uh, 40. Uh, Jesus was teaching in the temple. He said, how can the scribes that the Messiah say that the Messiah is the son of David? David himself, by the Holy Spirit, declared, Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I put your enemies under your feet. David himself calls him Lord, so how can he be his son? Lord's crowd was listening to him with delight. As he told, he said, beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and to be greeted with respect in the marketplace. They have the best seats in the synagogue, places of honor at banquet. They devour widows' houses, and for the sake of the kingdom, say long prayers. They will receive the greater condemnation. And, and, and so Jesus talks about walking the walk. Uh, and, and, and so he represents a new understanding of the Messiah. Not, not one that is narrow and only concerned about a political agenda. And as the Messiah who, who brings newness, he differs from many of the, those who claim to follow him, but who have a serve me and a give to me mentality. You want to, you've heard me say, if you want to make some people really upset, uh, don't call them by their title. Don't sit in there. Don't dare sit in their seat. Don't give them the respect. But we serve a Messiah who came to serve and to give. And that then our appearances ought to flow then from the spirit of that Messiah who, uh, along with the Father, has anointed us with the Holy Spirit. There's a difference between appearances and the anointing. There are some people who look holy and who look the part, but cannot live the part, cannot pray the part. One, I, I've told you about this one lady who once said, the devil can do everything that a, a believer can do. The devil can sing, the devil can pray, the devil can preach, the devil can praise, uh, a devil can even give an offering. But there is one thing a devil cannot do. A devil cannot live the life. And so, even though we might look the part, 
that when the anointing is upon you, there is a life that backs the look so that you can tell that someone has been with Jesus. No matter what they have on, there is a certain kind of look and carriage and personality and demeanor. And it's not found in uh, uh, the shallow things that we often base religiosity on. And we need to know that there is judgment upon the shallow, that the Lord himself will pronounce judgment on the shallow, and that life itself will make us back up what we believe. I, I'll never forget when I was a young man in my early 20s, I uh, preached a sermon that was in that day and at that time was very powerful. And, and this Pentecostal preacher uh, who was my senior walked up and said, that was a really powerful sermon. And then he looked at me and said, young man, when you preach like that, the devil will make you prove it. And, and, and I just need to say that when we walk around with the veneer of religiosity. Devil will make us prove it. And that's why we have to be careful about what we say and what we sing, cause the devil will make you prove it. But, but, but if there is reality behind what we say and sing, then the devil can do what he want to you can say like Paul, I know in whom I have believed. And I'm persuaded that he's able to keep everything I've committed unto him against that day. And so in this chapter, we have the leaders, the scribes, and the Pharisees with the veneer and the appearance of religion. And, 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 and then look at the next thing found in the Scripture, verse 41, he sat down opposite the treasury. Watch the crowd putting money into the treasury. Many rich people put in large sums. A poor widow came, put in two small copper coins, which are worth a penny. Then he called his disciples and said to them, Truly I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the treasury for all of them have contributed out of their abundance. But she, out of her poverty, has put in everything she had, all she had to live on. Notice that the Bible specifically says that Jesus sat down opposite the treasury and watched the crowd putting money into the treasury so that these people who are walking around with all of these uh, religious uh, emblems of holiness, tempting to be so pious, he was sitting there watching to see how much money they put into the treasury. Uh, and he sat down intentionally because he recognized that giving is a major indication of love, faith, and commitment. He is a savior who gives, who gave his all as a ransom for many. And so then he looks at giving as a major indication of our commitment. And, and listen to his fascination of the widow's giver. Her giving, her all reflected his love and that he gave his own. Her giving her all reflected his commitment and that he suffered greatly for our redemption. Her giving her all reflected her faith and that the Lord continued to trust God even when things were at their lowest for him on Calvary. He never spoke of his crucifixion 
<clears throat> without also prophesying his resurrection. And so she is a reflection of him. And, and we often forget that it says that she put in everything she had to live on. She took, brought her whole social security check. She needed to pay her rent, buy her medicine, food, put it in. She gave everything she had as an indication of her love and faith and the sufficiency and the power of God to supply, just like he did. We focus on quantity. However, Jesus is able to take quality and work miracles with small quantity. Two fish, five barley loaves. What can you do with that? Maybe feed one or two people? No. He took the small that was all the boy had. And, and and fed the masses. And that's the story of the rise of many churches and mega churches. No, no church starts out as a mega church. It is when people give their all, not just leaders, but when people give their all, the churches become mega churches. This is the story of black colleges that were not started with well-endowed givers, but they were started with people who uh, had a vision for a better life for their children. And so they bought their nickels, pennies, dimes, and maybe a dollar, pooled them together, pooled them together, and made colleges. Jesus knows how to take the quality and make great quantity. And so you don't need to come to the Lord and talk about all that you don't have. The Lord knows that. But if you're willing to surrender whatever you have, then you are, he can work miracles. The, the greatest need of the kingdom and the world is more Mark 12, 41 through 44 widows. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> People who are willing to take whatever they have and surrender it to the Lord. That's what we invite you to do now. Wherever you are, whatever you have, Jesus is willing to work a miracle with you. And if you've never turned your life over to the Lord Jesus Christ, do it now. He's still a miracle working God with lives. Email us at info at St. Philip. We'll be happy to pray with you the prayer of salvation. If you need a church home or a new church home, I'd love to be your pastor. Email us now at info at stphilip.org. We invite you to worship with us on Sunday morning at 8. Make a decision to become a member of this body of Christ. We'd love to have you. And before we adjourn, if like the widow, you would like to give an offering, email us, or you can use any of our giving platforms, GiveLify, PayPal, uh, online giving, text to give, kiosk, cash app, and, and reflect the love and the gift and the surrender and the faith and the passion that the Lord has shown in his sacrifice and resurrection 
on Calvary. As God did not let his death become the last word, he will not let your gift and your sacrifice become the last word. But eyes have not seen, ears have not heard, neither has it been revealed in the hearts of people the good things God has in store for you. Well, we've enjoyed this time together and we look forward to our being together again next week as we continue our walk through the book of Mark. Let us pray. God, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for how you continue to speak to us through your word, and how you continue to work miracles in our lives. Now have your way. Hold our hands. Guide our footsteps. Uh, be in our tongues as we speak your good news to others. Protect our families all of those whom we love and hold dear. Pray that you would heal us of our diseases, and that you would grant breakthroughs and issues that we've been wrestling with and praying over. And we thank you even now for what you're going to do. In Jesus' name do we pray, that with thanksgiving. Amen.